If you open your Bibles with me to the letter of James, letter of James chapter 1. Now we know that the history of the church began on the day of Pentecost. And as as Peter preaches the good news of the gospel and urges the people to repent from their sins and to place their hope in this risen Jesus Christ, thousands of people were added to the church. Sometime later, Peter preaches again, then thousands more become believers in Jesus Christ. But the harmony, the comfort, and the favor of all the people to the church suddenly stop with Stephen's death. And so, some time goes by, and James, the half-brother of Jesus Christ, writes a letter to this persecution-driven and scattered believers. And so this morning, I want to focus our attention to the first, or on the first 12 verses of this letter together. So James chapter 1, verse 1 through verse 12. James servant of God and of Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes of the in this dispersion greetings count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness at least steadfastness has its full effect that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." Let the lowly brother boast in his exaltation and the rich in his humiliation because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass and its flower falls and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. If you took time last week and read carefully through this short book, you would have noticed several things. First, This letter is filled with commands for us to obey. The book of James has 59 different commands, and obedience is everywhere in this book. Because genuine faith acts, and genuine faith works. The second thing you probably would have noticed is that in his book, James addresses a number of practical issues like Poverty and social justice and prayer and planning for the future, patience and many others. And third, as you read this letter, as you read it, you get a sense that the book of James can be an uncomfortable book to read. Very likely that James would not be a popular preacher today because James in this letter speaks of difficult and very uncomfortable issues. He is very firm in his theology and unapologetic in this message as he lays out the demands of his theology before his readers. The book of James is tough and sometimes can be uncomfortable to read. Yet, this book offers much hope not only to the Jewish believers who were scattered throughout Judea and the rest of the world as a result of persecution, It offers much hope to believers today who live in this world as strangers and aliens. Because for us as Christians, this is a foreign country and we long for the day when we can go back home. And so as these first century believers were 
forced out of their homes because of the persecution, no doubt that they were asking themselves many, many questions. Questions like, are we ever going to return home? How long will this persecution last? And will our lives ever be the same as a result of our faith in this risen Christ? No, these questions are not in the text, but these believers were just like you and I. They were just regular people, and we would be asking these very questions. But James, in his letter, answers None of these questions. He gives him no hope that all will be well again. In his letter, James gives him no encouragement. There is no hint of encouragement that everything, that their circumstances are temporary and they just, just hold on a little bit longer. Instead, James begins this letter by answering a more fundamental and more important question. Why and how do believers go through trials and temptations? In fact, one of the most difficult and complex and perplexing questions that God's people can ask is, why does God allow righteous to suffer? God loves his children and he is all-powerful, why doesn't this God protect those who he loves? Now, James doesn't give us a full answer to these questions, but he leads us, he leads us behind the scenes of what God does and tells us what these trials are for and how to go through them correctly. And so in these first 12 letters, we begin to study together this letter of James he tells us three things about trials. He tells us about the purpose of our trials, about the hope for our trials, and about the attitude in the midst of these trials. And so first, the purpose of our trials. Now, I suspect that even without reading this letter from James, we all know a thing or two about trials. We know because we have been through many trials ourselves. But for some of you, it seems like your entire life has been a series of one trial after another. Yes, we understand that we live in a world that has been broken and corrupted by sin. And so it is no surprise to us that sometimes we experience things like sickness and loneliness, frustration and disappointments unfulfilled dreams, unmet expectations, losses, fear, criticism, conflicts. We get it. We get it. This is a fallen world, and from time to time, we almost expect to go through difficulties. Every one of us here either just went through a trial in your life or is about to go through one. We just don't know when or which one. And this is the uncomfortable reality of life. And we know this much about trials, even without James. And so when it comes to the nature of trials, James doesn't tell us anything new. In fact, James doesn't give us a list of trials. He simply groups all the trials together. Small trials, big ones minor trials, and the major ones together, and he simply calls them various trials. And he does that because trials are part of a human experience. But as Christians, we also understand that God is in full control of everything, including trials. In Lamentations 3.38, Jeremiah says, Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that both Adversity and good come? And the answer to that question, yes, absolutely. Both good and bad come from God. He is in full control of everything. God speaking through the prophet Isaiah says, I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. 
The Bible is very clear on this point. God is in full control of everything. And intellectually, we understand this because God is omnipotent. He has all authority and all power and all dominions are subjected to His rule. Nothing in all the created things outside of God's control, nothing from the movement of planets around the sun to the movement of a small ant around your kitchen table. God is in full control of everything. Sovereignty of God is one of major tenets of a Christian faith. Now, we can't explain how God does this, how He rules the universe. We simply believe this to be true about our God. Now the difficulty comes. The difficulty comes where in the midst of these trials we must embrace this truth. Because it's one thing to believe in the sovereignty of God when life simply marches on. But it is altogether different when life suddenly takes an unexpected turn. When your child gets seriously ill. When you lose your job. When you have been betrayed and wounded by a friend, it is painful, it is frustrating, it is disappointing, and it is precisely in these moments that we begin to ask very uncomfortable questions, questions like, why is God allowing these things in my life? Why do I have to suffer? It's not that in these moments we forget that God is in full control of everything, no. Most of the time, most of the time, no matter how unpleasant and painful the trial is, we know that ultimately it all comes from God. That's not the difficult part. That the difficulty comes when we have to live in a way that reflects our faith in that sovereign God. That's really when it becomes difficult. But it's true of anything when our faith has to become real and practical. And so as we begin to read the letter from James, it seems to me that he makes this task even more difficult for us. Out of 59 commands that we find here in this book of James, the first one we see in verse 2 where James says, Count it, and it being trials, count it all joy. Other translations say, consider it a great joy or pure joy. Now remember, this is not a suggestion of how a Christian might behave in the middle of trial. James is not suggesting, he's not saying that we have liberty when it comes to our response to our trials. This is not one of several options how a believer is to react when Unexpected things happen in our life, as if some can respond with joy and others have a different way to respond and process these trials. No. This is a command. It is an imperative. It's a verb that addresses how we think. It's not about our feelings. Trials don't necessarily bring a smile to our faces. Uh, this is not simply about a putting happy face and pretending that everything is okay. And so when our life crashes down on us or on people we love, James doesn't intend for us to simply carelessly tell them, consider it all joy, my brother, my sister. We know this to be true because we know the character of Christ. When Lazarus died, Christ had compassion on both Mary and Martha. Surely God knew the purpose and the reason for the death of their brother, but yet he meets with them, he comforts them, and he weeps together with them. And so James here is not suggesting that Christians who face trouble will have no response other than joy as if we were commanded never to be saddened by our difficulties and losses. What kind of God would he be if he commanded us to look at our losses and not be moved by them? What kind of God would he be? 
No, the point that James is making here is that trials should be an occasion for genuine joy. This only makes sense when we understand why. Why can believers react to trials with such a strange and unexpected response as joy? Sometimes we go through life and wonder why little trials are there. Car breaks down, we lose our phone and we have to buy a new one, have to transfer all the numbers. But life simply marches on and we don't dwell on these things too much. But when big stuff comes, the tragedies, the difficulties that make these everyday trials seem so small and insignificant, we begin to think, what is James talking about when he tells us to consider all of it as great joy? How can Bible be serious about this? But here's what we need to understand. The command to rejoice in the midst of trouble does not stand on its own as if that were one of the Christian virtues. No. The absurdity of where James seems to start in his letter begins to make sense when we understand and realize that troubles and trials are not joyful in and of themselves. There's nothing joyful even in our smallest troubles. But they become a reason for great joy when we understand that it is through these trials that God accomplishes His purposes in our life. That's why James here in verse 3 says, You know. You know. You know that these trials test your faith and produce endurance. The idea is not that God allows trials in our lives to test whether we have faith or not. No. Testing here describes a process of refining some precious metal. And so every time we go through a trial, whether it's a big one or small, it is God's way to refine and making our faith strong when it faces resistance. Did you know that when astronauts first went into space, and then they came back, it took a long time for them to be able to walk again? Because there's no gravity in space, there's no resistance. And so over time, their muscles simply atrophied. Christians learn to remain faithful to God over a lifetime when we face difficulties. Trials, James says, produce endurance. But even endurance is not the final goal of testing. We must let endurance do its intended work. And the benefit of testing only comes when we respond to these tests that God allows in our life in the right way. And when we do this, this endurance, this endurance produces in us various dimensions of godly character. That's why in verse 4, Jesus, uh, James says, let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. This really is the ultimate purpose for trials in this particular passage and in the book of James as a whole. God's goal for our life is maturity in Him as we grow in His likeness. One day, every believer will stand before God And it is God's will from now until then to prepare us for that day. Really, that is the summary of the entire life of a believer. God's will for us is to be perfect, complete, whole. That is God's will for you and for me if you are a believer in Jesus Christ. But none of us are there yet. 
And so God will often use trials in our lives, both small and big, to accomplish His will. Everything, and I mean everything else in my life and your life, takes a distant second place. But we don't think about our life this way, do we? It's not that we want to become famous and rich, at least not all of us. But we do want to have a good job, to accomplish certain things in life, to have a good family. And so when trials come into our family, into our work, or into our plans, they devastate us. But if our primary goal in life is to mature and to become godly men and women, then we can have joy because no matter how tough these trials are, they are moving us towards that goal. Now, this doesn't mean that we somehow need to radically change our life right now, our lifestyle, no. But what James talks about here in these four verses require a completely different perspective on life. Now, think about any trial that is in your life right now. It could be something small or something very significant. If your goal is to simply fix your circumstance, you will always be disappointed and frustrated because circumstances will not get fixed in the way that you want them to be fixed. They might never get fixed at all. Or even if somehow you manage to straighten your life, something else will always come up. But if the ultimate goal of your life is to know God and be changed by Him, then the circumstances and trials, they don't matter. As long as they move us towards that goal and help us to grow in our godliness. One commentator said it this way, our values determine our evaluations. If we value the material and physical more than the spiritual, we will not be able to count it all joy. But if we fix your eyes on God and the knowledge of Him and maturity in Him, then trials will be joy because they will teach us to know Him, to love Him, and to trust Him. Now James understands that it's not enough just to tell his readers that their trials have a purpose. It's a great purpose. In fact, it is the best purpose because this purpose comes from God, but even knowing our trials doesn't make it easier for us to go through these trials, does it? And so he next tells us about the hope for our trials. We all know how to solve problems. We've been solving problems ever since we were born. We solve them in school, at work. We solve problems around our kitchen table. Life is full of problems that we must keep solving. And the hope is that the longer we've been solving these problems, the better we become at solving them. In fact, one of the main reasons why people get promoted at work is because they're considered extremely good at solving complex problems. To find answers, we often go to books, technical papers, instruction manuals, internet articles, or simply rely on our past experience, YouTube. We do this because the problems in our life that we're facing right now have already been solved by someone else. And the task then becomes simply matching the right solution to our specific problem. But what do you do when you are walking through trials and there seems to be no easy answer? How do we find a solution when we realize that we don't even understand what the problem is? You see, when we're going in trials or through trials, we don't know all that's going on or have the right perspective on things or lack experience in what to do. Now, James is being very generous when he says, if any of you lack wisdom. The truth is, we all lack wisdom. And when it comes to trials, we all have deficiency in wisdom. 
Wisdom, James says, is that one quality needed if we are to endure trials with courage and godliness. So just like in verse 2, here in verse 5, James gives us an authoritative command. You should, you must ask God for wisdom. Letter of James, if you've been reading Letter of James, sometimes called the proverb of the New Testament. Not only because James practically and faithfully reminds us how to live as Christians in this world, but because as we read through this book, we see that how he said and what he says often echoes the writers of the Old Testament. And so when James tells us to look for wisdom to God, he confirms what the Old Testament writers have said before him. For example, in Job 28, or Job's in chapter 28 said this about wisdom. Where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? The deep says, it's not in me. And the seas, it's not with me. From where does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? Abaddon, or destruction and death, say, we have heard a rumor with our ears. And then in verse 23, he gives the answer. God understands way to it, and he knows its place. And God knows where wisdom is because he has the wisdom. And in Proverbs chapter 2, we read, the Lord gives wisdom. So here's what James is doing. In the first Four verses, James gives us the purpose and the reason for our trials, and that is God's ultimate will is that we know Him and become mature in Him. And for that one purpose, He will send various trials into our life. If you are a believer in Christ, that is God's will for your life, to know Him and to become like Him in His character. And without wisdom, James says, not possible. Wisdom, James says, is the essential means by which a Christian can both understand and live out the will of God. In other words, without wisdom of God or from God, you and I cannot do the will of God. And having wisdom in trials is so crucial that James commands us to Pray for wisdom. See, it's God's purpose. It's His will to transform and to change us. And so, because He is the one that sends trials into our life to accomplish His will, He will give us all that we need to go through these trials. Christian, when it comes to certainty, this is one area where we should have no hesitation in approaching God. He will never scold, rebuke, or criticize us for not having all the wisdom we need. God gives wisdom generously and without question, but we must ask for it. Sounds pretty straightforward, doesn't it? But then James gives a caveat. You must ask in faith without a doubt. And this is yet another one of those very uncomfortable places in this letter. And it is our own personal experience with trials and prayers that make this particular passage uncomfortable for us to read or believe. We've all been through trials and we've prayed for wisdom in the middle of these trials, but still we could not with certainty discern the will of God or what we should do. And so this raises all sorts of questions in our mind. How much faith do I need? Can I really believe that God will answer me? Is there absolutely no room for any doubt? And if after praying for wisdom, we still don't know the answer or don't know what to do, what does this say about me as a believer? Now, it's easy for us to tell someone who's going through trial, pray for wisdom. 
And we should do that. We should encourage each other to pray for wisdom. And we should pray for one another as, uh, as we're going through trials. But when our own faith is being tested, sometimes we have reservations about fully trusting the outcome of our prayers. We do this, one, because we've had experience where God did not give us clarity about a certain situation we were in, and two, because we don't pretend there's no room for doubt in our own prayers. Now, we don't dismiss prayer altogether, but we don't stake everything on the outcome of that prayer. That, my friends, is problematic. Because without the wisdom of God, we will never be able to go through trials in the way that change and mature us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, and all of our trials will be wasted, and that would be a great tragedy. And so James, here in these next verses, addresses our two concerns. First, He says that when we ask God for wisdom, he will absolutely and without a question give us wisdom. Verse 5 has to be one of the most beautiful and encouraging promises of all the scriptures. If you don't have faith, if you don't have wisdom, sorry, ask God and he will give you wisdom. This is the God of the universe saying, I will pass my wisdom to you. So how do we deal with our own experiences then of asking God for wisdom and still having no idea of what the right thing to do is? Now we have no problem in asking God for wisdom. It's the receiving sometimes that we have the issue with. So how then do we reconcile our prayer for wisdom on the one hand and inability to make wise decisions on the other hand? The answer to our dilemma cannot be that God simply refuses to fulfill his promise to us. Remember, this is not James' promise to us. It is God's promise which is built on the nature of his eternal character. So, if the very nature of God does not allow him to break promises to us in this regard, the problem must lie elsewhere. And to address our second concern, James gives us an answer in the form of a question. Who is this person that should not even expect to have his prayers answered? Is it really someone who never doubts in her prayers? But there's one place where we can find in the scripture great men and women of faith. It's in the letter to the Hebrews. And there in chapter 11, we read names or names of people who were praised by God Himself for their extraordinary faith. Now, these people come from different walks of life. They've accomplished different things. And yet, each of their life is marked by an unusual faith. But when we examine some of these lives closer, we see that these were not perfect people who had unwavering faith. Take Abraham, for example. We know that at least on one occasion, he laughed when God promised to give him a son. At that point, Abraham doubted God's abilities. But what gives Abraham a rightful place in Hebrews 11 is the consistency of his faith to God over many and many years. And so James is not saying that prayers will never be answered by God wherever there's doubts exists. In our current weak condition, doubt, at least occasionally, is inevitable. But here's what James wants us to understand when it comes to faith and prayer and wisdom. God will respond to our prayers only when our lives have a basic consistency of purpose. In other words, the the direction of our life must reflect the character that we hope to develop through these trials. 
So if God uses trials to change us, to mature us in Christ, then the aim and the overall direction of our life must match that description, must fit that direction. Not perfectly. Only Jesus Christ fits that description perfectly. But there must be evidence of spiritual integrity for God to answer our prayers. So doubter is not someone who occasionally hesitates in his prayer for wisdom. A doubter is a person who has no anchor for his soul. One day he needs wisdom from God and the next day he needs the wisdom of this world. A person like this does not pray with consistency and sincerity of purpose. There seems to be a contradiction between his claims to be a Christian and his lifestyle. James says a person like this should not even expect to get wisdom from God because it will be of no use to them. I get it. When we're in trial, we just, we just want God to change our circumstance. God says, come to me and ask me to help you understand why this is happening in your life. And I will give you perspective on what you're going through. And I will walk with you as the one who has the, knows all the things and has the reason and a purpose for each of them. The sovereign king of all creation makes his wisdom available to you and to me. And so when we go through trials, ask God for wisdom and trust him to give it to you. I think of a person who, in their wisdom, helped you in the past to get through some difficult time in your life. Chances are that next time you need an advice, you will go to that person again. This is how God wants us to develop a relationship with the well as well. But God is right all the time. And so the more we walk with him through the trials, the more we will trust in him by nature. Trials are tough and can be very unpleasant. But our greatest hope in trials is that God, through His Spirit, gives His wisdom to His people. James has one more thing to say here about trials in verses 9 through 11. And that is, to be able to go through trials correctly, we must have the right attitude. It seems like after telling us a lot of things about trials, about the purposes of trials, about the hope that we have in the midst of our trials, James here moves on to a different topic. But when we get to the end of our passage, verse 12, we see that here James is still on the same topic. So why in the middle of this section on trials does James talk to talk about poverty and riches? I believe he uses This is a specific example to illustrate an important truth about trials. There were two men, James says, one was poor and the other one rich. The poor one had nothing and no one. And so as he's going through his trials, he's all alone. The rich one has both resources and connections. But James reminds us that trials have a remarkable leveling effect. Sickness, and loneliness, conflict, disappointments, losses, and many other trials don't distinguish between those who are well off in this world and those who have nothing. All believers, regardless of their socioeconomic situation, face trials in their life. And so the principle of this illustration is this. As believers, we must look beyond our position in this world or what the world thinks of us and instead take pride in who we are before God. Our spiritual identity in Christ, that's what's significant. One of the greatest things about the gospel is its ability to flatten all man-made hierarchies. So James addresses the poor believer who feels insignificant because he has nothing by the world's standards. He encourages him to boast in his high position in Christ. 
So friends, regardless of what the world thinks of you, it is far more important what God thinks of you. And because of work of Christ and the death of His Son on the cross, the death of Christ on the cross, in God's eyes, you are a child of God and you are precious to Him. Yes, you will still go through trials, but in the midst of these trials, remember who you are in Christ. And at the same time, James encourages the rich believers not to put any hope in their wealth. James doesn't say that wealth in itself is bad. In fact, money is neither good nor evil. His point is simply is wealth and the stability that it promises is fleeting. And so rather than taking pride in your possessions or your positions, all of which will fade one day forever, in humility take pride that you can identify with the one who was despised and rejected by this world. Friends, we must always evaluate ourselves by spiritual and not material standards. And more than ever, this is true Today, because it goes against the grain of today's culture. Culture where poor people are being marginalized and ignored, and the rich are respected and valued regardless of their morality. But if the church is to be the kind of society that Christ intends it to be, then having this perspective about our true identity is essential for us. Now, James will say much more about the attitude we as Christians should have when it comes to how we treat people of various social classes. But from this text, we can walk away with two things. First, money and the things that money can buy are very powerful, alluring us away from our commitment to the Lord and therefore compromising our spiritual integrity. And so, if in our trials we are to approach God for wisdom and consistency of faith, we need to be aware of this major threat to our faith. Christ himself warns us that we cannot, we cannot love both God and money. That's one. And two, because trials and testing has been the main topic of this section, James may want to see poverty and wealth as perhaps the greatest test for all Christians. And for us to be able to withstand this test, he calls us to an unpopular attitude of humility. James Mueller once said, God delights to increase the faith of his children. I say and say it again, trials, Difficulties, sometimes defeat, are the very food of faith. We should take them out of his hands as evidence of his love and care for us in developing more and more that faith which he sees to strengthen in us. As James closes this portion of his letter, he highlights here two of the most important aspects of our faith. And trials. First, it is through trials that we learn to live for God's reward. I know there's some Christians who have difficulty with rewards. It's true, our obedience and our service to God should never be motivated by selfish ambition. We should never be asking ourselves in our service to God, what's in it for me? But the idea of looking forward to a reward as a way to encourage a believer in the midst of difficult situation is found everywhere on the pages of the New Testament. The picture here is of an athlete who runs the race and he looks towards finishing this crossing line as to receive this wreath at the end of the race. So when you go through trials or temptation, keep your eyes on the prize. And second, James says that this reward is promised only to those who love God. And that really is the key 
the key to everything that James has been saying. But more important than our love for God is His love for us. We would never, never know the love of God if it weren't for Christ. There'd be no reward. No hope in our trials. No purposes for our trials. But Christ's love for us motivated him to endure the trials of both the garden and the cross. Christ's love for us motivated him to endure the suffering, the humiliation, the pain, the rejection, and ultimately the wrath of God that was placed in him because of my sins. So my reward for enduring trials is not some fancy crown. What am I going to do with it? No, my reward is eternity spent in the presence of God who loves me so, so much. So yes, Lord, send trials. Mature me in Christ. And help me keep my eyes on you, my greatest reward. Father, we admit that we do not like trials. We do not like when you allow difficult things into our lives. We would avoid them if we could. Father, but we understand that these trials are not sent to punish or somehow to rebuke us. These trials are there to strengthen our faith and to produce in us something that we could never do on our own. So, Father, we know that trials will never go away until we meet you face to face. But until that day, Father, I pray that you would give us your wisdom to go through these trials. Wisdom is the only thing we can hold on to in the moment of trials because humanly we cannot explain them. So we trust in your grace and your wisdom that through these trials, uncomfortable as they may be, you are doing your work in us to perfect, to make us whole. Father, you are doing good work in us, that you have started us at one point in our lives. Father, as we go through life, through the difficulties and trials, I pray that we never lose sight of what you do through these trials. To hope and to pray for wisdom in your work in our life. Father, give us a glimpse of the glory that awaits us ahead of us, and more important, the glimpse of a meeting and spending eternity with you. May that motivate us to stay and endure what you send into our life. We can only do this by your strength.